epicenter of this disease is that this is a multi-system disease where cystitis and respiratory failure are the primary modes of morbidity and mortality in these patients are also involved, including the coagulation system, the kidneys, and the topic of conversation today will be the heart. Um, there has been a high prevalence of acute cardiac injury noted in these patients at 20% in the early studies. When we combine that with anecdotal reports of severe cardiac complications that I'm sure many of us have heard about through social media, through personal communication, has heightened the concern. Many patients have been reported um, with that sound like this, a COVID positive patient with cardiac arrest with minimal pulmonary disease, rapid progression of cardiogenic shock, severe cardiac arrhythmias, and STEMI with non-obstructive coronaries, which even has its own hashtag, hashtag COVID STEMI. It's clear that between these anecdotal reports and the high prevalence of cardiac injury that has been reported, this has really raised the alarm bells. Coupled with that, uh, the virus that causes COVID-19, um, which is called the SARS-CoV-2 virus, that this could actually cause direct myocardial injury. This is depicted here. Um, as all coronaviruses, the spike protein plays an important role in the pathogenesis of this viral. COVID-2 virus, which is causing the current COVID-19 pandemic protein attaches to the angiotensin the functional receptor by which the virus then is able to um, enter the cell certainly as a result ACE2 has received a lot of attention in the medical literature and through RNA sequencing studies, we see that ACE2 is abundant in the lung, the kidneys, but also in the heart, which implicates that possibly these organs are more susceptible to disease. So from these early reports, I think the central question that comes to mind is, does myocardial dysfunction play a major role in morbidity and mortality of COVID-19? And subsequent questions are, what are the cardiac manifestations and what are the underlying mechanisms of disease that connect COVID-19 to the cardiovascular? So over the next hour, we hope to shed a little bit of light on these questions. I have the pleasure of um, turning it over to Dr. Maioli to present a very interesting case series of patients who died from COVID-19. After she presents her case series, we'll return back to look at some of the literature that has connected COVID-19 in the heart and end with some possible mechanisms of cardiac involvement before opening it up for questions at the end. So with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Maioli. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. Uh, so like Dr. Harris was saying, I'm going to give a general overview of some of the COVID uh, findings that we've seen at autopsy. Um, we've been very fortunate to have a couple of medical examiners' offices in the region that have been willing to do these uh, high-risk autopsies. And then I will also give an overview of two patients, uh, one with typical uh, COVID symptomatology and a second patient with clinical evidence of myocarditis. Uh, I just want to let all of you know that this presentation contains data which is unpublished but is currently under consideration for publication. So when we were starting our autopsy series, we had a number of scientific questions of interest. The first being really what are the general findings in COVID-19 positive patients at autopsy? Uh, there have been relatively few case reports on autopsy findings on COVID patients, and that's due to a number of reasons, uh, mostly being of proper negative pressure rooms or lack of equipment. Uh, again, we see that there are two medical examiner's offices in the region which had the proper equipment, including N95s and PAPRs. 
And then is there histologic evidence of or direct myocardial tissue injury? Dr. Harris gave a overview of what our clinical questions are regarding COVID-19. Is there evidence of microthrombi? And is there any evidence of brain or brain stem? In and I will talk a little bit more about that later. So our general case series overview is we had 12 patients that had either COVID-19 positivity prior to death or after death, and they were selected for autopsy at both uh, King County Medical Examiner's Office and Snohomish County Medical Examiner's Office. Um, medical Examiner's Office are important in addition to their usual a task of determining cause and manner of death in uh, suspicious circumstances. Um, five underwent full autopsy and seven underwent a limited autopsy procedure. For the full autopsy procedure, it was your standard uh, typical autopsy where all the organs were removed, made, uh, received a full gross examination and were sampled for histology. And our limited autopsy procedure was in an effort to reduce exposure to those performing the autopsy and to reduce aerosolization risk. So these organs were examined in situ. They weren't removed from the body. There were no gross organ weights. They didn't get a complete gross examination. And very importantly, there was no brain examination. The oscillate that we use to open the skull uh, creates a lot of aerosolization risk, and we didn't want to put uh, folks at risk of catching COVID. So some selected features from our patients, the age was 70.4 years. So they were on the older side. There was a good mix of male to females. Um, median days from symptom onset, that is when they first started showing symptoms, not when they were admitted, was seven. But this was variable. Some patients really presented with symptoms, were admitted, and died the same day. And others had symptoms two weeks before passing away. Many of them had anti-mortem COVID-19 positivity, but there were two that had post confirmation. And this is because these autopsies were happening very early on during this uh, COVID pandemic, uh, and the amount of COVID tests was still quite small. So medical examiner's offices and homes were doing an amazing job of collecting swabs on patients that uh, were suspected to have COVID. They all received uh, antibiotics prior to death. One of them had elevated liver enzymes, and I'll talk about that patient later. Uh, there were seven patients that had lymphopenia, which is being reported uh, from our clinical colleagues. And there were two patients that had second um, pulmonary infection, one with flu and MSSA, and another patient they had pseudomonas. Some of the comorbidities of our cohort included uh, cardiovascular disease, the main cohort being hypertension and coronary artery disease, pulmonary uh, comorbidities, including COPD, metabolic, including diabetes and obesity, renal, quite a bit of these patients had chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal disease on dialysis, neurologic, including uh, traumatic brain injury with subsequent dysphagia, or uh, dementia, and a couple of these people history of cancer. So the first case I'm going to present is a patient with typical COVID symptomatology. So this is a male in his 50s who, uh, with a past medical history of end-stage renal disease, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and obstruct obstructive sleep apnea, who was feeling quite ill four to five days with a low-grade fever, poor appetite, some dizziness. Um, when he started to have a little bit of trouble breathing to an urgent care and was found to have coarse breath sounds on a physical exam and was also found to be hypoxemic. So the urgent care sent him to the local emergency room where he received chest x-ray and was found to have bilateral patchy airspace opacities, which seems to be a common chest x-ray amongst COVID patients. He was admitted to the medicine floor that night on BiPAP, but he really rapidly uh, declined as far as his respiratory function and was intubated overnight and admitted to the MICU. Really over the next days of his hospitalization, he had worsening fever, 
um, despite antibiotics and his infectious workup was negative. So negative viral panel, um, no bacterial growth. And he eventually had progressive respiratory failure and death five days after admission. And he did have a positive nasal swab for COVID. So I'll start with the pulmonary evaluation. And this, this portion contains some findings from this patient that I just described, as well as some from the rest of our cohort to kind of give a general overview of some of the spectrum of COVID pulmonary findings. So this gentleman had pulmonary edema and congestion on gross examination. And when we say edematous lungs on gross examination, uh, when your lungs at autopsy, you can squeeze them and kind of fluid comes out. So his lungs were quite heavy. So you could see the normal range for a right lung is 360 to 570. And his was well over that uh, at 1255. And his left lung was 1065 with a normal range of 325 to 480. So over twice uh, the normal weight of a lung. We didn't see any gross evidence of consolidations, which would make, make us think of a bronchopneumonia. We didn't see any acute hemorrhage and we did not see any pulmonary thromboemboli. So this is a low power view of the lung. You can see some cartilage on the right uh, from a large way. And this uh, slide is very eosinophilic, and that's secondary to autolysis. Uh, you can see these air spaces have the edema within these alveolar spaces. Here is a close-up of kind of the same picture. So we see this eosinophilic edema within the airways with some epithelial sloughing. So what we mean by that is some of the cells that should be lining these air spaces are kind of off and into the airspace. You can see some of these cells here. And these cells are larger, they're reactive, they have big um, nuclei. And that's something that we could see in any kind of lung injury. This is a similar picture with another reactive cell, which I'm gonna point out here. So the cell, again, uh, he has a, the cell has a large nucleus with a prominent So that makes us think that this is a very reactive cell. And again, you could see in the rest of this picture, we have a number of these cells sloughing off into the air spaces. This can be seen in various types of lung injury. It's not specific. And this picture is showing a multinucleated giant cell. And multinucleated giant cells were something that were appreciated in a subset of our cohort. So it wasn't, they were not prominent finding, but they were present in a, in a subset. And these giant cells were actually something that was also seen in the original SARS. And that makes sense since these two viruses are related. And then this is just pointing out some congestion. This picture shows some cyto intracytoplasmic inclusions, um, as you can see here. So we see these basophilic uh, granular particles within the cytoplasm. And they, there were some ultrastructural studies on the original SARS that suggested that there were some nuclear protein aggregates uh, identified in the cytoplasm. Um, it's really unclear what their importance are, but we did see these basophilic inclusions in a number of the active cells. This is the picture of the patient's trachea, and it's kind of hard to appreciate, but really in the center here, it looks a little congested or remic. And when we looked at this, under the microscope, we saw some edema as well as congestion. So this kind of loose stroma is the edema, and then we've got some congested blood vessels below. And this is amazing. So all of our patients, unless they had a do not intubate order, were intubated. Some additional pulmonary findings from other patients with COVID. So here we have a eosinophilic inclusion in the cytoplasm. Again, these are viral inclusions. They very well could be, uh, but more research is needed. And this was only seen in one patient, so this was not a prominent finding. And then we have some possible imperipoesis, uh, which has been reported on, but again, this was seen in one patient, so this was not a prominent finding. This is a picture of some highland 
veins. So 75% of our cohort had some kind of diffuse alveolar damage, whether it was in the acute phase or the organizing phase. And when we think of uh, acute uh, alveolar, we think of hyaline membranes as being a real hallmark feature. And there are these waxy uh, strands. Uh, what was interesting was that how long the symptom uh, metology was, we saw there an organizing phase in both that had very short symptom to death intervals and those with very long uh, symptom to death intervals. See a fibroblastic proliferation, which is more in keeping with a organizing phase of diffuse alveolar damage. And this is interesting because early studies out of SARS suggested that patients that had longer symptoms and kind of carried this virus longer had lung damage that was more consistent with an, an organizing diffuse alveolar damage phase, but we kind of saw both cohorts of patients, which makes us wonder whether there is an asymptomatic period where there is still lung damage happening um, or whether these patients were dying of something else causing this lung damage and that just happened to have COVID. And that's still very unclear at this point. Now onto this patient's cardiac evaluation. So he had a very heavy heart. So normal for a gentleman would be 270 to 360 grams and his was 685. You can see that there's biventricular dilatation with the right ventricle looking a little more dilated than the left. But we didn't see any evidence of, uh, gross evidence of remote infarctions. And this was his coronary artery. So this is his proximal LAD. So he had focal 45% stenosis, um, but his other coronaries were clean. This is just a low power view showing the extent of his chronic uh, cardiac disease. So he has a lot of interstitial fibrosis. So that's all of that light pink in between the cardiac myocytes. And he has an area of replacement fibrosis in the lower um, left-hand corner. So that means that that light pink fibrosis is really uh, getting bigger. Consistent with some chronic ischemic injury. We didn't see any um, acute myocyte damage and we didn't see any increased inflammation to make us think of myocarditis. So some additional findings. Uh, he had granular kidneys. Um, that makes us think of hypertension. And he did have a history of hypertension. So that goes along with his clinical history. And his kidneys quite a bit of chronic damage. So he had end-stage renal disease on dialysis. So this is not surprising at all, um, but he had global sclerosis. He had some interstitial fibrosis and he had some Kimmelstown Wilson nodules, which are so these are all again, chronic changes that go along with his chronic kidney mm -hmm. of chronic uh, lymphocytic inflammation in the background, but that also along with his chronic disease. His liver was heavy, it was pale. Um, and you see in the bottom right-hand corner of the liver that there is some kind of brick red color to it that looks a little nutmeggy, and that makes us think congestion. His liver was congested. There's all these fat droplets within the liver, which is steatosis. So he had micro and macro vesicular steatosis, which is a finding that has been seen and reported on in other COVID autopsy patients. Um, and he also had these really cool Mallory Dank bodies, which are eosinophilic cytoplasmic inclusions in hepatocytes and have certain types of liver disease. It's really not specific. It can be seen in a number of conditions, including cirrhosis, obesity, um, carcinoma amongst others. So, and he didn't, he was, he had obesity, but he didn't have anything else. Um, but the macro and micro vesicular in these patients, the etiology is really unknown. It is unknown whether this is due to COVID infection or due to the biotic use during surgery or during um, hospitalization. And this is a picture of a spleen. This didn't come from this patient. Uh, but there has been some reports that there was reduced spleen weight in some of these patients that were COVID positive and had autopsies. Um, we didn't see that in our cohort. They all had normal to maybe slightly larger spleen. Um, but three patients did have reduced white pulp. So you could see kind of in the upper corner, there is some 
like lymphocytes, that's our white pulp. And there really should be a lot more of that. So it's, we call this reduced white pulp. So this patient's cause of death was COVID-19 pneumonia. And we, called, uh, we said his contributing factors were diabetes and stage renal disease on dialysis and hypertension. So now I'm gonna talk about the second patient. And this is a patient with different symptomatology this is a woman in her 70s who returned from a recent trip to Egypt, Jordan, and Germany. Uh, she was feel unwell towards the end of the trip. Uh, a friend that she had gone on the trip with actually had upper respiratory symptoms for about a week prior to this patient becoming sick. And right before returning to the United States, you know, she started to just overall feel tired, unwell. Um, with a fever. Um, and after three days feeling unwell, she went to the emergency room where she had a fever of 38.3. She was tachycardic at 114. Her blood pressure at 78 over 39. And her SpO2 was 70% on room air. And just like the first patient, she had diffuse pulmonary opacities on chest. And her respiratory function very rapidly decreased. So unlike the first patient who was able to kind of linger a or needing to be intubated. She was intubated very soon after arriving in the ED, and she was started on broad spectrum. Six. Um, so her initial evaluation it showed that she had a high white count. Uh, she had elevated liver enzymes. Her lactate was 4.6. Her initial troponin was 11.5, and she did have positive flu testing in the ED. Um, she also received an echo showed um, an injection fraction of 30% with heterogeneous wall motion abnormalities. And it is worth noting that this patient prior to the sickness was very healthy. So according to her husband, her only um, past medical history was really some uh, hyperlipidemia and osteoporosis. Otherwise, she was a woman that was going to the gym every day. She was very active. Um, so she really didn't have any evidence of cardiac or respiratory disease prior to being sick. So this echo was very um, surprising. Over her hospital course, um, her troponin did downtrend. Uh, she had dusky fingers, was very poorly perfusing. She kept getting a high fever, worsening respiratory failure. She was on pressors. She was on very high vent settings. Her COVID test was positive. On day four, she ended up having unstable AFib bar treated with amiodarone. And she really continued to go in and out of AFib uh, the remainder of her hospital course. And then on hospital day six, um, she continued to have respiratory failure despite her other labs improving. So her liver enzymes got better, her lactate improved. Uh, her creatinine improved, but her respiratory not. And they transitioned her to comfort measures and she passed away. So this, the question for this was much more specific. Was there evidence of myocarditis? Just to look at her pulmonary findings briefly. She also had very heavy edematous lungs. She didn't see any consolidation. So again, no evidence no gross evidence of bronchopneumonia, no acute, no pulmonary thromboemboli. This patient, um, it's a low power view. You could see some fibrin, intraalveolar fibrin. So we've got some fibrin deposition within the airways. And then you can also see some hyaline membranes. So this is really consistent with an acute phase diffuse alveolar damage. She had a edema in her lungs, and again, some hyaline membrane formation. Here again, we have congestion and some reactive looking cells uh, with big nuclei and uh, hyperplasia. And she had some prominent metaplasia, which again, can be seen in really any kind of lung injury. So this is not specific, but was an interesting find. and edematous. She was intubated for quite a while. And the 
very cool thing about this case was we had done autopsy patient really through our initial group of autopsies. So we had been able to look at the histology for our first group of autopsy patients, come up with new questions we wanted. And one of the questions that we had was, could we isolate this uh, virus on electron microscopy? Could we find it? So we collected some fresh tissue to run EM studies. And the EM lab was able to um, EM on a number of her different tissues, but this is coming from her lungs. And we can see some double vesicle formation with uh, mem uh, no, yeah, spherical double membrane particles. So here's a close up with the little spike proteins. So consistent with COVID. So now on to her cardiac evaluation. So when we think of myocarditis in pathology, we think of the heart increased cardiac inflammation and acute myocyte damage. So we really need to see both to call it myocarditis. Her gross exam was both for cardiomegaly at 490 grams, um, but she did not have significant atherosclerosis at all. And she did not have any evidence of remote infarction. The vast majority of her heart looked like this. So look at this picture. We see cardiac myocytes. We see some interstitial spaces. And you kind of get the impression that it's a little more cellular than we're used to seeing. Um, there's no large collections of uh, inflammatory cells. And like I said, the vast majority of her heart looked like this. But there were some areas where we were seeing some increased lymphocytes and some myocyte damage. So you can see the lymphocytes kind of trickling along here. And then second arrow, you see some of these myocytes falling apart and looking stringy. So that's acute myocyte damage. And that explains why her was so elevated. Here's another picture showing some cardiac myocytes with some increased of the sites in the background. And we do see some uh, interstitial widening, um, which could be edema, and that could explain why her heart is large or heavy, if you will, and some increased lymphocytes with associated myocyte damage. Here's another area of her heart. And here's viral myocarditis. Um, so whether this was due to COVID infection or due to the flu is really unclear. But to answer the question, did this patient have myocarditis? Yes. Uh, on to her liver evaluation. So just like the first patient, she had um, macro and microvesicular steatosis. And this patient also had ventrolobular necrosis with some bridging. And that's consistent with shock liver, and that goes along with her clinical presentation of having elevated liver and admission. Here's just a close-up showing the necrosis. Um, you could see some congestion background by these bladed spaces and some bridging. So it's kind of off the picture, but there's another area of necrosis that the two are bridging. So one uh, of the questions was really, is there any brain involvement in patients with COVID? And that's been a question to answer for a couple of reasons. One being that there hasn't been a lot of autopsies in general. And this being that even in our cohort, we did not take the brain out of many patients. So again, we only did five complete autopsies. And that's really due to the oscillating saw causing some aerosolization and wanting to reduce that risk. Um, with that said, though, there have been a number of reports either talking about an encephalitis or wondering, could some of this respiratory decline be central and due to some effect of the virus on the central respiratory centers? And, um, there have been some questions using your sense of smell, 
Um, so there's definitely, you know, just like the heart, there's some interest in the brain. So in this patient, when her brain was examined, something that was interesting, she had these diffuse punctate subarachnoid hemorrhages, which really hasn't been described before. Um, and we really don't know the significance of WISH. There's one of them. And then another interesting finding was, you know, like I said, there's, there are these questions of whether have respiratory centers, um, is there any effect on the brain stem? And there have been some suggestions SARS and MERS that maybe the virus really does affect the brainstem more than some other areas in the brain. Um, and when we neuropath evaluation on this patient, she did have these punctate hemorrhages in her brainstem, but really, so that's interesting. We don't know the significance of this, but it makes us wonder. <laughs> Curtis, really unsurprising, we were able to get the highest levels of virus in the lungs um, and the trachea. And she also had some in a subcranial lymph node. We had lower levels, but positive levels in the heart, liver, spleen, intestine, and which is really in keeping with what Dr. Harris was saying earlier. This ACE2 receptor is in many organs, and that explains why there is multi organ involvement in these people with COVID. So to summarize Kate briefly, so her cause of death was acute respiratory distress syndrome due to viral pneumonia due to COVID-19. And her contributing were influenza A, staphylococcal pneumonia, myocarditis, cardiomyopathy, and septic shock. And again, we even though we saw evidence of myocarditis, her picture is complicated because of her dual viral infection of COVID and the flu, which the flu is known to cause myocarditis. So some things that were missing in our autopsy cohort is that we didn't include, or we didn't have patients that were described with a new onset cardiomyopathy or conduction. Interesting to see what was going on in the hearts of these patients. Um, as they're able, the local medical examiner's office are gonna continue to perform some of these COVID autopsies uh, to help address some of these questions and other questions. And we do have autopsy results pending for a patient with complex cardiac history who presented with bradycardia and AV block and was found to have COVID. So stay tuned for more. So some overall findings and take home points. So just kind of summarizing our overall logic findings in our 12 patients with COVID is the vast majority of these patients had really reactive looking which in the original SARS, but is something that's totally nonspecific and can happen in other of lung injury. A lot of them had very heavy edema. Patients, um, and a number of these patients had some uh, bronchopneumonia, bronch uh, bronchitis, bronchiolitis, um, 